Welcome to a very special episode of Let's Talk Love. We're hosting a roundtable discussion with Esther Perel and Dr. Alexandra Solomon, where we ask them your questions and they answer about love, relationships, and everything in between. Both Esther and Dr. Solomon are authors, day-to-day therapists, and world-renowned speakers. I feel so lucky to have had the chance to learn and grow and better my relationships because of their wisdom. And I hope you enjoy as well. So we're just going to jump into questions. Okay. But I think what actually you talked about earlier, Esther, when we talked, was about the fact that you are practitioners. Both of you, both you, Esther, and yourself, Alexandra, day in, day out, you work with people. You work with individuals, couples, in your day-to-day practice around these themes and challenges that we all face in relationships. And it's just, it it doesn't get any easier, (laughs) right? Um, but can we just actually just start there on oh, no, just like, this is, this is the meat of it. Like you just, you're doing it right before we get into the questions. Like this is, this is what you're used to, right? Yeah. So this is not new. These, the material we're going to touch no. on today is not new No. and it's real and it's mm-hmm. like for all of us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is, um, you know, it speaks rather than to the com- community that you have built that people, you know, people don't bring you sort of the, the five cent questions, right? People are bringing you the meaty, paradoxical, complicated, requires more than a step one, two, three kind of an answer. And so that's right. That's, that's, the, that's what you are inviting us into with your community's questions, that there's not, neither Esther nor I are going to give you or your audience like the answers to these things. We're going to give paradigms and frameworks and ways of, of how do we sit with how do we sit with the discomfort? How do we sit with the tension? How do we kind of grow our capacity? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So first question I want to ask is can you please share what in your life is giving each of you something that's giving you joy right now? And what is one of your greatest challenges that you're working through? Mm -hmm. Because we all have, like, it's like this paradox, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's life. (laughs) Do you want me to start? Yes, Yes, go ahead. So I think that, I think there's a way in which my greatest joy and my greatest challenge are like right next to each other because I I think so much of my joy right now is where I am life stage wise. I love feeling wise. I feel wise at this point. You know, I feel good at my job. I feel hard to ruffle. I feel like a mentor to a next generation of clinicians and future leaders. And I, I love, there's so much joy in that. Like I think about 24-year-old me would just be like, you've got to be kidding. You're friends with a stare and you get to do these. You know, it just, it's such a, there's so much joy in this stage that I have worked so hard to move into and become, you know, skilled at what I do. And there's so much joy in that. And then I think my greatest challenge is sort of related to time as well, which is I can get kind of grabby about time right now. Like I start sometimes to count backwards how many more moments like this do I get to have with my kids or how many, if I don't reach a particular career milestone, will it, will it slip away? So I think that my challenge is to also just allow time to be what it is. I notice change, you know, change in my own sort of age related changes that I have feelings about. So my challenge is also to kind of like move with time and not do the Am I too old to do this, or is it too late for me to do this? So I think that's that's where I where I sit. So when you ask me about um, what brings me joy, I, my first reaction was simply exactly this moment. I am with a dear friend and colleague. I am with another colleague who I've just met, but we are both already thinking, "What a smart woman! What a <laughs> pleasure to talk to this person." 
this, those questions they gave us are really interesting. God, I get to really delve into a subject I'm passionate about, relationships, and I get to do something that I've wanted to do for a long time, which is to speak not only about it and to it when I'm in my office with my patients between the four walls, but to really bring a certain psychological, what Alex calls wisdom, a psychological wisdom or experience or confidence um, to, the, to, to the world. And um, that brings me tremendous joy. So you talked about wisdom, I would have said confidence. If I had mm. the confidence of today with the looks of then or the youth <laughs> of then. But when you, you know, it's like it only gets better is really the, the surprise. You get to do more of what you want because you know more what it is you want and um, and you, you get to care a little bit less what other people think about it. You don't mean to be right. You don't need to be the only one. You just want to mm. be relevant. Mm -hmm. And you want to be relevant in your personal life. I want to be relevant in my personal life. I want to feel like I touch my friends, my family, that they touch me, I want to be relevant in what I write and what I do. And that brings me tremendous joy. Um, and I, you know, I went yesterday in, to, to a, a play and, and I'm on the street and I'm walking and somebody recognizes my voice, not just by my voice, I have a mask and, I, and I'm thinking, they, if, if they recognize me by the voice, they've listened to the podcast. Because the podcast, you listen with AirPods, you know, and, and it's intimate in your ear. And I'm thinking, God, all these people, you know, I, I, I'm, I accompany so many people that I have no idea about in their, mm -hmm. in their daily life kind of thing. And what gives me challenge is that I sometimes am very voracious. I, I really want to be in three places at the same time. I want to do this and this and this because I think I am so lucky to be able to do these things. And um, that's why I said to you that I often have to get a chastity belt around me <laughs> because <laughs> I tend to want to do more than I can actually handle. And then I get all stressed and panicky, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that, I'm not go that something's going to slip through my fingers. But, of course, I put too much in my hand. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I really, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I feel like that's me in a way. There's so much opportunity and you're just like, how do you contain it? It's like, oh, but you have to choose, right? And that's when you come to in, the, in your life, I think, when, when, you have, when you have all these opportunities, but you can say no. And what are, what are your boundaries? And then you're, all this, the learning continues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. So we have so many great um, community questions for both of you. One of the questions is, how do you maintain independence in a relationship while having deep intimacy and partnership with another person? I'm 52. I've been divorced for five years. I have fear around the idea of entering a relationship because I'm worried I might lose my independence that I've worked so hard to find. And I think this is like so true for so many women that have like you walked out of you walk you you actually worked to end a divorce or maybe it wasn't your choice, and then you spent all these years by yourself rebuilding mm -hmm. yourself, and then what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's not so difficult to be independent when you are on your own. <laughs> the true test of independence <laughs> is when there is someone next to you. Wow, that is that is powerful right there. Right? I mean, said, being wow. independent when you are rebuilding yourself, that, that kind of is, it comes with the territory. But maintaining a sense of separateness, of individuality, of differentiation, when you are in a relationship, that's the, the true independence. Because mm -hmm. the independence is only created in response, in relationship to the connection, to the interdependence. Otherwise, you wow. can't define. It's like you can't know what is joy without knowing sadness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can't know what is independence without knowing connection. Otherwise, you're on your own. You're alone, you're, but you're not independent. 
unless we define independence as the ability to to rely on oneself, to take care of oneself, to you know to handle things by oneself. But that's a, that's a more narrow definition of independence. Mm -hmm. It's how do you hold on to yourself in the presence of the other? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. independence. Well, and she's and there's a way in which this this community member is building. She's she's setting herself up for it being a problem. She's saying, "I'm afraid of losing independence," as yes. if it's a finite resource rather than something renewable. Right? It's renewable in the space between she and her future partner. She can say to her partner, "I'm not available to go out tonight. I'm going to be with my girlfriends tonight, or I'm going to be in bed with a book tonight." Like that. There's there's the idea. Right? She's confusing connection with dependence or smothering or suffocating, which perhaps that was. I mean, perhaps what she's pointing herself towards really is a, perhaps a story from her first marriage. Maybe that was the way she was in her first marriage as she conflated being a good wife with being, you know, a smile on her face, always of service, no needs of her own. And so, and so she may need to just reimagine what it means to be in, like truly in partnership and to choose a partner who really celebrates that she is resourced in lots of ways with friends, with activities, with hobbies. Somebody who, who celebrates that is going to celebrate time apart as much as they celebrate time together. But I would add to that, Alex, also, that um, it is the best thing is if you have someone who says, go ahead, have a great time. I'll see you later. Yeah. But you may also have somebody who says, oh, I really wish that, you know, you need to be able to say no and to accept that the other person may not like it. Uh, that too, you have, you have to be able to, to, to tolerate the, the, the maybe discomfort on the other side and that you don't abdicate in order to avoid strife mm. or, or displeasure on the other side. You're allowed to say no and the other person is allowed to say, oh, I wish you would come anyway. And those two shall coexist. That's yes. another part of independence. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, there's, a, there's a bigger discussion around this today, around um, conflict and just... I think you made a great point because both of those can coexist. I have a point of view, you have a point of view, and it's not right or wrong. It's like they both exist. And we, understanding that, like yeah. getting through that. Yeah, and disappoint. Yeah, there's a partner who says, "I wish that you would do this." It's very different than punishing, right? So that's yes. that's another that's a different world, right? If there is retreat and sulking and punishment and criticism and guilt tripping, that's very different than, "Ah, oh, I wish." We, my husband and I, get into this because there are he his bucket for time with me is larger than my bucket of time with him. Like I need a bit more, especially in this chapter of our relationship as we're emptying our nest. I just want a lot of alone time. And so there are times when I'm not available. And then he'll say, oh, you poor thing. You have a husband who wants to be with you all the time. Like, it's so sad for you. You know, like that's in this chapter, he has a larger bucket. And so I have to not confuse him being disappointed that we have a different need in this moment. He's not, he's not punishing me. He's not guilt tripping me. And he is disappointed. He has a different set of desires and interests sometimes. next question is, I have been with my partner for 20 years. We met as young adults, got married, had two beautiful children, no major issues. But my husband has rage issues sometimes when the slightest thing happens and he really goes and loses it. I try to do my best to placate him, but it just doesn't work. Right? So do I go through the major, like, how do I, she's, she's saying, do we go through um, like going through his thing, or do I rec recommend we go through counseling? What's your advice? I think this is a, I mean, I think it's a wonderful, yeah, I mean, built, I think it's a wonderful uh, matter to bring to couples therapy. I don't, you know, she describes it, she describes rage issues. I mean, the word rage is, is a strong word. She, um, I don't know how somebody else, uh, I don't know how he experiences it. I don't know how, how a therapist would experience it, but certainly that gives me pause. Like I want, you know, the, the uh, if they've got kids, I think that this is a somebody who's got um, kids at home, right? And so I can imagine that there's, she's, she's writing about kind of placating 
him. Um, I think it certainly is a matter to bring to a couples therapist. As my supervisor, Bill Pinsoff, used to say, God is in the sequence. And so we would really want somebody to be looking at the sequence of what happens, like what are the antecedents to his rage episode, what's leading up to it. Um, and and that there's a set of skills, you know, the, the kind of the nice thing, if there has to be a nice thing about this, is that emotion regulation skills are teachable and learnable. And I don't, you know, if we looked at his family of origin, it may be wholly understandable. This is a man who does not know how to do mm-hmm. relationally empowered communication. All he saw was silence or rage. So it might actually be a skill deficit. And those are some teachable and learnable skills. The thing I don't want is for her... You know, if 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 she's if what she does is tippy toes, placates, and smooths over, then he has chronic experiences of himself as unable to control his emotions and the people around. I mean, there's a few things worse in the world than being fully aware that people are are tiptoeing and walking on eggshells around you. So there's a way in which him her placating reinforces this idea that he's inadequate, inept, problematic. You know, whatever. And so he deserves a chance to learn these skills so that he can feel really proud of, of handling a frustrating moment differently than he was able to before he learned some, some things about emotion regulation. And at the same time, this is entirely presented by one partner who says, we are together 20 years, my husband has these outbursts, and you, what has been your role vis-a-vis these outbursts? You know, he has rage and you have what? Placating could be one thing, tiptoeing, mm-hmm. but it also could be contempt, dismissal, mm-hmm. belittling. So the, if, the, if the God is in the sequence, the God is also in the dance. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go to couples therapy, you don't just go to present your the problems of your partner and you say to the therapist, fix it, he's got some rage outbursts. You also look at the dance, in, you know, what happens when he begins to go just a tiny bit up, do you already immediately hear it as rage? Because after 20 years, there's a very rigid pattern in place. So the minute you begin to think of it as rage, you shut down. The minute you shut down, he feels abandoned. The minute he feels abandoned, he screams louder because he hopes that that's how he's going to get through and you're going to hear it. And the minute he screams louder, you say, you see? Mm-hmm. You have rage <laughs> then, issues. Mm-hmm. You know, you have rage mm-hmm. issues. Mm-hmm. So the, it's a, it, it, the question is a beautiful question, but it is a question that is that presents the couple through the lens of one person and generally every person in a relationship at this point is has a lens but there's also a dance what he does that makes her do what she does that makes him do what he does and it becomes the more x the more that the more that the more this Um, and that's what they would be looking at in couples therapies Uh, otherwise he can go alone and get those skills Mm -hmm. But the question is, does he even see himself as such? Or does he answer and says, and what about you? (laughs) You want me to tell you your issues? Um, Or is it that she's on her, that she's wondering, do I want to stay? And she's looking for something that is legitimate to possibly go. There's a lot of questions I would have here before I just say, here is what you do with your, you know, screaming husband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And... um, I'm sure that when you listen to this community member, that the question I would ask you is what has been your relationship to this? You're trying to calm him down. Obviously, you say it hasn't worked. That's not so true. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there 20 years later. You must have done certain things that have worked quite well. Mm -hmm. And maybe they worked well for, for certain things. You know, in what way did they work well and in what way did they not? I sense you're fed up. You're kind of tired of this. And um, tired of what? Tired of what he does or tired of what you do? <laughs> and I would, I would want to invite you to think a little bit more because the story, the way you tell it, is very set. And this is the issue with couples, is that we settle on a story. And the change begins when the story opens up and invites mm-hmm. other possibilities of another story. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. Oh! <laughs> so, the next question is, after getting to a place of knowing the two main roadblocks of my two-year marriage, I shared these with my partner. Instead of being 
received and heard and in a safe place, I felt criticized and unsupported. How do I proceed with seeing if we could work through these roadblocks given the previous sharing? This one flows. This, this one flows right from the last one, doesn't it? We are, you know, we we don't know if we if we if we got to be flies on the wall and we kind of got to watch how she presented the two roadblocks, we'd have much more insight, right? Because there's there is I think there is a, a danger or a risk at least in a presentation of okay, my dear, here's our two roadblocks. What are we going to do, right? She she kind of came in potentially with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a request for change rather than the positionality that we love to, to help couples get into, which is the two partners side by side looking together at the knot and kind of building the story about the dance, the pattern, the sequence together. So she's identified two roadblocks. Does her partner identify the same two roadblocks? Like, do, do they use different language, the same yeah, perspective? Hers, right? Yeah, I mean, I, listen, we can, I think we can do two things at once. We can validate that it must have been immensely painful to, 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 take, to get up the gumption to present, here's what I think are the problems in our marriage, and to feel criticized and unsupported. I have every confidence that was immensely painful. And I really want to make sure that she's setting the two of them up the best way possible by putting a really, really relational framework around those two roadblocks. Because my fear is that the two roadblocks are, if you would, you know, if you would do more of this, we'd be better. Or if you would do less of that, we'd be better. And I don't, we don't know, but that's, I think that would be the challenge is to how do we hold the empathy that comes from feeling unsupported along with that invitation or ask to make sure that this is a really robustly relational presentation of the pattern, the dance, the cycle that keeps her as much in the ring as it keeps her partner in the ring. So what you see here is that both of us think systemically. Yeah. We look at problems in a context and we look at how the relationship organizes itself around the problem because that organization is what maintains the problem as well. And it's not just we take the problem, you know, we look at the ecology, we look at the, 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 the transactional, um, uh, or, you know, the dance around it, you know, how it gets repeated. Now, that said, she brings something up, and I think the thematic here is, what do you do when you are with somebody who it can be very quickly defensive <laughs> and kind of has a knee-jerk reaction? And when you say, I'm hungry, they say, you didn't ask me to cook. You know, it's like I say something about me and they hear something about them. And they have a ve they personalize it all the time. Yeah. And they hear a wish and every wish becomes a criticism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are people who are critical and behind a criticism is a veiled wish. But there are people who are just talking about a feeling, an experience, something. And the other person hears the whole thing as a criticism. And mm -hmm. so they're instantly back, you know, with this defensiveness and you... You know, you just cannot, you, you can't say anything about you or you have to so, you know, massage it and massage it that in the end, you know, you prefer to go talk to your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that it's hard. It's hard to walk on pins and needles all day long. Oh, it's very uh -huh. difficult. It's uh -huh. very, because, you know, it's difficult because we're talking about this over years or months or years. In the beginning, you do this very kindly and, and with full heart. And you say, oh, you know, you, he can be sensitive sometimes. No, honey, I didn't mean it like that. Like, you know, but over years, <laughs> this becomes like, shh. Oh, it's like a child, you know, right? Again, like, I just can't bother, be bothered to talk to you because, because all you hear is you, because you're at the center of the universe. And sometimes I say to people, you're very important, but you're not that important. <laughs> not everything is about you. You know, if, she, if she's just trying to tell you about something, you know, then, of course, you ask, if you have both people, may I ask you what you just heard? So yeah. first of all, you go for the distortion. What is yeah. it that you just heard that made you react the way you did? Because obviously... Sometimes somebody says, you know, I wasn't hungry yesterday, so I didn't want to eat. And all you hear them say is that your food sucks. Right. You know, so what did you hear? You know, and then you try to understand how come, you know, from this to there, it went through such a transformation of uh -huh. meaning. Uh -huh. And then you try to locate that t distortion into a larger story. How, how is it that that's where your ear takes you? 
that it takes you to a place where you're going to be put down, criticized, belittled. Where did you get used to that translation? And then, you know, you also go back to the to the other side, and now you say, you know, would you, if there was a way to hear what your partner said in a way that doesn't make you feel bad, would you want that? Does that draw you? Does that, are you curious about what it could be like to listen to your partner without instantly thinking that once again they're coming at you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's so often, it, it's so often, it, like there is this piece that is intrapsychic, right, internal about my ears are primed to hear your feelings, to hear your experience as meaning that I've disappointed you, I've screwed up, I've failed you because of my relationship with me. And your love cannot outpace, like the, your love cannot be the only force that heals my shame, right? There's something about the it's experience so of shame. Yeah, yeah. There's something about the experience of shame that really is my reckoning with self. You can say, I'm here with you. You can say, I love you. But there ha there's a piece of it that cannot land inside of me if shame is in the driver's seat. And that, that experience of shame, and I think that very often is. And when, you know, if the person, if the, the defensive person or the critical unsupportive person, if that person is a man and and there's not like that sort of, I think there's an added kind of challenge of sitting with the, the immense vulnerability of shame, right? The immense way that I hate feeling like you're disappointed in me because it, I turn it against myself and I feel so inadequate. Not that I did something that was disappointing, but that I am disappointing. And that piece is so, it can be hard to get to and it's essential to get to because, because she can put ribbons and bows and softness and you know, color and shade and texture on her description. But if shame is in the driver's seat, shame is going to find the, see, I knew it. I knew that you were disappointed in me, right? Because that's just what shame does. So there's a part of it that is like an individual reckoning with self of, about being able to kind of just tend to oneself a bit more gently. Three exclamation points at the end of this sentence. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, I don't have to add anything. It's just uber important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the next question is, and this is a discussion in our community quite a bit around the erotic and understanding that between our, with ourselves and with our partners. And the question is, what tools would you recommend for having conversations with our partners to better understand and explore our, our, our erotic desires and the, question, the second question around this was also, when should I bring up conversation around kink and fetishes in our new relationship? You want to start? <laughs> I, I mean, I would actually like to separate the two questions. Okay. Because I would like us to talk about the erotic and erotic desires without it, in, it leading also into the question of fetishes and kink, which is equally important. Mm. There's a beautiful question that I borrowed from Gina Ogden, and it goes like this. I, I'm in front of two people, and you can do this alone with your partner. I turn myself off when, or I turn myself off by, I extinguish myself, I shut down, I numb myself by, which is not the same question as you turn me off when, or what turns me off is. So I turn myself off if I do emails before going to bed, if I feel bloated and I overeat, if I have been really anxious about the kids the whole day, mm. if we haven't had any time to be together, if it's been weeks since I had a minute to myself, if I've not been able to just walk in nature and smell the flowers. You know, I shut down one. And you will notice that the majority of things have very little to do with sex. They have to do primarily with permission, with self-care, with the presence of pleasure and joy in your life. And it's from that place of worthiness and of permission and of pleasure that the erotic energy comes. Erotic energy in the sense of aliveness, vibrancy, vitality, life force that becomes sexualized, but that is not in and of itself just sex. You can have sex and feel dead. Mm -hmm. What we, we're talking about here is the aliveness that precedes the sexual encounter with oneself, the sensual encounter with oneself, you know. 
I turn myself on when or by is very different from you turn me on when or what turns me on is I awaken my desires when and they go back and forth, you know, so it's a very conflict free kind of conversations. I awaken my desires, I, I ignite myself when I'm in nature, when I play music, when I go out with my friends, when I go dancing, when we spend good time together, when we laugh, when, you know, when we connect, when we feel alive, when there is energy between us, that, that is the erotic energy. So this is a very nice, easy entrance for talking together. So because then the next thing is, if what turns me on is to, to go run every day or to go dancing, then the next question is, when's the last time you went dancing? And if it's mm -hmm. been six months, then reconsider. And you can dance in your house. I mean, mm -hmm. the point is, when you do something that is playful, imaginative, you know, free of responsibility, it's usually connected to desires. Then when the question about how do you bring in the idiosyncrasies of your own sexual proclivities, fetish, kink, or anything else, anything else, I think the question is just simply, what is erotic intimacy? Mm -hmm. How do two people talk about the parts of themselves that they often have spent years learning never to talk about to anybody? <laughs> learning never how do you talk start about talking it. about the stuff we've been silent about all the time and mm -hmm. had to hide? And basically, the issue is fearing judgment or ridicule or contempt or shaming because our erotic desires are often contradictory, un un not understandable to ourselves. They're mischievous. They fly against all other ways that we tend to look at ourselves. And that's why it seems um, so, you know, not normal, not normal as people are. And then the question is really it, a preamble, you know, um, you generally have a sense if you are with someone who is in a similar community as you, mm -hmm. sexually speaking. But if you're not, and you realize that you are crossing a Rubicon to be with them, and there is a, a whole world of sexuality that they don't have know or have never been interested in, then it becomes um, how much difference can you accept? How mm -hmm. much of... How much real intimacy do you want? Because people say, I want to be intimate, but don't tell me anything that I can't stand, mm -hmm. that I don't like. You know, how much, in, how much of me do you really want to get to know? Mm. And can you do it from a neutral place? You don't have to like what I like, but can you be curious about it? Because sexuality is a text that reveals us at our most basic intimate. And it's, if you talk about your sexual preferences, you're talking about your deepest emotional needs. And the more you go into fantasy land, the more that is even deeper mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Your fantasies are the code language with which people express their deepest emotional needs, but disguised as sexual preferences. But the needs are emotional. I want to be taken care of. I want to be that little child again that is just carried. I want to feel really powerful without having to be afraid of my power. I want to be able to surrender and know that I can completely be unselfconscious and the, nothing bad is going to happen to me. I, those are the emotional mm -hmm. needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And those are translated through the preferences, through the fetishes, through the king, et cetera, et cetera. Translate. Don't think that yeah. a conversation about sex is just about a bunch of actions and behaviors and moves. That's, Esther, as you're saying that, I think that makes it so much more approachable. Because I think sometimes, I think sometimes when the question is when do I when do I bring this up, it's like I have to disclose to you something that that you're going to have a reaction to. Versus if it's embedded in a deeper conversation about what are you looking for, what are you wanting an experience, then the rope, right? The rope is not. It's not that I'm into ropes. I'm into this experience. What I love to experience is the sense of, as you're saying, surrender or power or closeness or so that that's. And that makes it, I think it makes it less frightening then, right? It's not like I have to tell you these five things I love. It's these are the kinds of experiences that the erotic opens for me. That It's a gateway. The erotic is a gateway into this. And so it's less a confession then. That's and, correct. And you yeah. can do it as a, when you read a book together. You can do it when you're watching a series together. You can do it when you're listening to Where Should We Begin. We can do mm -hmm. it when you're listening to Alexa's podcast. You can do it when you're playing the card game of Where Should We Begin. I mean, you, you, you're just playing and the yeah, card yeah, yeah, gives yeah. you a container and yeah. it says, you know, something that I wish I could tell, uh, you know, something I, I wish people knew about me sexually. Right? Mm -hmm. Now it's in the card. The mm -hmm. card is making you. When do you have to 
to tell it when the card is that's the one right. that tells that's you right. to tell it. Right. You no that's longer right. have to deal with, we have to choose the right moment. So frame yes. it, find playful, creative containers like games, not just mine, there are plenty of them out mm -hmm. there, um, that, that gives you a, a safe structure to then take risks. Mm -hmm. right. Triangulating, triangulating in... A, a resource. That's right. And then it is. Yeah, I love that. It's not the. It's not me. It's the card. The card asks. So now, that's right. I lo it's so much less frightening. It's so much less of a confessional. And I'll just. I just want to put the three exclamation points on that um, Gina Ogden exercise that you have. I've done that when I was at your the workshop you did with um, Dr. Holly Richmond in March. You had us pair up with another attendee at that workshop, and we right. did rounds back and forth. And it was beautiful. I mean, I, you know, it, it was beautiful. It's so simple. I love those things that are just so simple, but so powerful. And I, I love that now, Robin, your audience is going to have that exercise to, to play together because it also, it keeps such a relational frame around sex. It's not you do this thing wrong, or how could I want sex when this is what's going, it really is. It's taking such, it's taking responsibility. And it also, so it's just like, it's, it's self-revelatory, but it also then gives us a chance to witness the way that our partner is different. Like, I didn't know that for you. I didn't know that this kind of a situation shuts you down, right? That's, that, that, that there's no, how on earth could we expect that two people coming together are going to have the same set of accelerators and brakes, you know, at, at every moment in time? So it's a chance to also learn about each other. It's not that either one of you is right or wrong or good or bad. It's like, what are, how does your, how does erotic energy flow through you? How is it different than how it flows through me? And how do we capitalize on that and work within that? So I'm so glad that you talked about that exercise. Every one of these questions could be an hour long answer. Oh, Let's be I clear. Know. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, we're already halfway through. I, I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> I back. don't like it. <laughs> okay. So many people struggle to decide when it's time to date after being in a long-term relationship. How do you know when you're ready to start dating? One question is, I've been, I'm 15 I've been, I was w with a 15-year marriage. It's coming to an end. We've been living separately in different countries for nine months. But we've only just now had the official separation conversations. My body is really shouting. It wants to start dating. So I started chatting with people on Tinder. It's been super fun and has made me feel really alive. But in equal measures, I'm blindsided by huge feelings of sheer panic, which you can understand, right? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if I should sit with the panic and move through it all and keep dating or just take, take it from a signal from my nervous system that I'm just not ready. What do you think? It, it makes total sense to me that she, you know, is basically spinning a wheel of emotions and sometimes it lands on joy and giddiness and sometimes it lands on panic. Like that is, like that is the, the experience of grief, right? To, to end a marriage, even if she feels very clear and very ready and very planful, there is, there is grief. There's grief even in what we choose and certainly something as big as a 15 year long marriage ending, there's going to be grief and, and in grief, there's, there's no, no feelings of the wrong feelings. And so I don't know that I would want her to take the panic as a signal. I would want her just to kind of invite it like, oh, there's panic. You know, what, what is panic saying? And how do I kind of make space for that in, in the whole kind of tableau of this experience I'm having? And it means that she gets to titrate. She gets to go at the pace that, you know, her nervous system is, is ready for. She doesn't, there, nothing needs to happen until, you know, she, she can take little, little nibbles and little bites and pause and breathe. And I would hope that whoever she is dating kind of has at least a, a sense of where she's at. This is not something she needs to be, I don't think, secretive about, that she's just beginning. And that much of this is unknowable because some of it is she has to kind of dip a toe in and then take a step back and catch her breath and dip a toe in. So it all, it all makes sense. It all feels really reasonable that, you know, if, 
if she's sitting, I've, I've, I sometimes when I'm teaching about this topic, I've got these sort of like gut check indicators. And one of them is if you're sitting on the date and all you're doing is kind of running this person through the filter of your ex, you know, either they are nothing like my ex, so I'm never going to love again and I'm doomed, or, uh-oh, they just said this one thing and it reminds me of my ex. If that's the only, if your filter is just, is, is the lens of the ex, it might, that might be a sign you need to just kind of take a bit of a smaller bite, right? We want, I want her to be able to meet somebody on their own terms and get to know them as themselves rather than filtering through, you're not him or you are him or I'm scared you're him. So that would be one thing is I really would want her to be going at a pace where she gets to have the experience of the date. A, a date is just an opportunity to sit with another human and just feel what is it like to be present with somebody and play with these possibilities of who, how does it feel when we share space together? Who might we be to each other? What kind of a story would, would the two of us create together and kind of on its own merits? Ditto. And I would just very briefly add, you know, life is a bit a story of beginnings and endings all the time. And when you end something, you have the last time of everything, and then you're going to have the first time of everything mm. else that is new. And so you're going to be panicky. The panic doesn't mean to don't do it. The panic just means something's happening. And you're doing something that evokes certain feelings. Um, and that's a, a combination of excitement and insecurity and uncertainty and curiosity and, uh, and you know, all of that mixed in. Um, I think this idea of am I ready to date is a very individualistic framework. It's like I first have mm. to prepare myself. You know, I have to put all the spices around me, and then I can put myself on the grill. And uh, <laughs> that really, and, and, you know, we live cut. in relationships. We live in relationships all yeah. the time. Some of them are on the way out. Some of them are burgeoning. Some of them are on a plateau. Some of them are spiking. It, it's part of a whole list of things. So um, are you curious? You know, I think the grief piece is the central thing, you know, and and. I, you, when do you know? I remember when I was, you know, what, in my early 20s. And I remember saying to somebody, I know that I can start because there was a moment where somebody looked at me and I actually caught their eyes. I finally was ready to see and to be seen. Mm. Plenty of people were looking, but I probably didn't notice because I was, like Alex says, in the filter of the previous one. That is, and that, so I didn't see a right thing. There. That's horrible. And at one there. moment, like I saying, saw, I was ready to I be saw the person in front of me, yeah. and I knew something has opened up again, and I'm, mm. and I'm ready. I finished the cycle, and I'm ready to begin a new cycle. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Really, really mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the spices on the grill. That's so fun. Yeah, that is so. Are you ready to get on the grill? You didn't it also, that. you know, it's the way that in this realm of relationship education and relationship coaching, there's a lot of people turning to the expert for tell me, tell me the five signs or the five. That, and you're right. It is. It's highly. It's it's individualistic. It's capital T truth. You know. I think it. And I think it reveals how freaking vulnerable all of this stuff is. So just tell me, what Esther. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't want it vulnerable, do arranged marriage. I mean, you know, then you don't have to sit. Then your feelings don't really matter that much yeah. because they're not the ones that make a decision. They matter, yeah. but they're not deciding. But if you want a free choice enterprise around relationships, then you, it comes with tremendous ambiguity and ambivalence and a lot of things that are not utterly clear. But what makes the problem is not the lack of clarity. What makes the problem is that we think that it should be utterly clear. Right. That we should know exactly when, <laughs> you yeah. know, that is a kind of a, um, you know, by by experiencing when you are with somebody and you realize that you're utterly not interested because you're still in your previous story, then you have a sign. That's mm -hmm. a sign, not mm -hmm. the panic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not something somebody else can tell you necessarily. Yes. Yeah, yeah. good. But I think what you're seeing is that both of us, uh, you know, we're not so quick at saying one, two, three, I know, I'll no. tell you. No. Though it's tempting and there's lots of folks out there who are given that, who are selling that. <laughs> so this, this question is, I'm nearly 40, newly dating someone. I cannot who, hear you anymore. Oh, 
Can you hear me now? I mean, I, I literally, you are at maximum, and I cannot hear you. Is this okay? Better. Okay. Is this, is this better? Yes. Okay. I'm nearly 40 and newly dating someone who I finally feel is a match for me. My values, my desires are my life. We're future tripping on creating family, children, working together, and getting married. He's 47. Both of us come with worlds before. My question is about dating and about the idea about creating a relationship agreement, a document to align us in a variety of areas of life. Do you suggest we do this? And if so, where should we begin? What's the best process for creating this and making sure it doesn't suck the romance out? <laughs> I, I'm picturing a spectrum, right? Like one end of the spectrum is no conversation about values, boundaries, fears, expectations. And the other end of the spectrum is, right, the sucking the, you know, sort of like a, a contract, an eight-page contract that spells out things that are um, unknowable and that need to be revealed over time and that are efforts to control and micromanage um, vulnerability. So those are kind of, if those are like the ends of our spectrum, I want them to find some shade of gray between that where there's, I don't, maybe a formalized, maybe agreement if it feels really mutual and there's room for it, if, it, if it's seen as a working document and a live document, um, that might be really beautiful. Um, but that it, if it's sort of from the ground, if, if what it does, if it becomes the excuse or the forum in which to have really beautiful conversations about our values, about our boundaries, about our fears, then I'm here for it. I'm here for those kinds of conversations but I want, I guess I'm thinking about like the energy, like what's the energy that infuses it? If the energy is the energy of collaboration and love and bounty, I'm, I'm here for that. If the energy is control and fear and what if, then, then that, then I would, I would not be as, I'd be more concerned that that's kind of falling on that end of the spectrum of trying to kind of squeeze the juice out of out of relationship, because I think that is a risk. In some ways, in some ways, I think this moment in relationship is we've swung, right? The pendulum has swung from everything is sort of silent and hidden and covert to I think there is like a risk that we're so far at the other end of the spectrum where everybody is negotiating every possible aspect that there's times that I just like my eyes cross. I'm like, like, oh my it's, gosh. It's, it's restriction. Yeah. It's rules. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreements. Yeah. But I like the word agreements. I do like that word because agreements yeah. has that like I sense do, of collaboration. I, do too. I, do too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that you can. One nice way to 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 frame it is that there's a philosopher that uh, talks about relationships can be defined through exclusivity, through exclusiveness, or through uniqueness. Exclusiveness focuses on what you can't do, on the boundaries, on the surveillance, on what you know, on the restrictions. Uniqueness focuses on what is special here. Mm. And it's two different codes. So I, too, like the word agreement. I think that if you're 40 and 47, you should feel free to go about it, uh, you know, in, in the way that deems uh, sensical to you and that is creative and imaginative. There's many, many ways to do family building and family mm -hmm. creation, and this is what you are doing now. Um, you know, what are the values that you want to put on that argument, uh, agreement? I think that your view about a living document is essential. Come back to it once a year. You take a trip. You go sit in nature, mm -hmm. and you look at your doc, and you update it, you know, so that it becomes really a, a third, you know, a supporter of the relationship, a witness to the relationship. This this document is not just there as, you know, your, your, your pseudo-legal thing, but more yeah. as a witness. You know, what is the world that you would like to create together, that you want to live in together? Who are the people that you would like to invite in order to create that world together? You know, um, hmm. what, what are some of the things that you say would be really hard to overcome? Don't say, I will never accept or I will never forgive. Just that you know would be major egregious 
ness into, into the relational agreement. Um, what do you wish for each other? What do you commit to, mm. to do? Uh, you know, where are the places that you know you're going to have to work on? Um, all of that may be part of a relationship agreement rather than just, you know, we travel together or we don't, you know, you, you get to go, you, you get to spend as much money as you want to loan or no, after $500, you have to ask the other person what they think, uh -huh, you know. Uh -huh. So the, it, there's different, there's really not one kind of agreement. So what do you want to achieve with the agreement? What is the meaning of this agreement? What would you like it to do for the two of you? That will inform what are the different clauses of the agreement. Mm -hmm. well, but as an idea, that. I think it's very important. If yeah. you marry in your 20s, in a place where everybody knows what are the gender roles, you know, who does what, mm -hmm. you know, who has which privileges, who owes what to whom, it's clear, it's duty, it's obligation, it's hierarchically set up, then you don't need to talk much because it's passed on from generation to generation and everyone knows what they need to do. But if you want this free model that is more creative in which you have to spell it out, then the, the scaffolding is all around conversation. It is the art of conversation yeah. that establishes the relationship at this moment. With a formal agreement or without, it's the same conversation. Mm. It sure is. I love that. I love that. And I love the idea of part of the agreement is we agree to not bring the agreement to the other and say, look, you didn't, you're falling down on clause number 3.2, you know, that it's not going to be, it's not going to be weaponized, used as a cudgel, that it's, uh, I love the idea of, re of updating it. I wonder also if it might be an interesting challenge to create an agreement with no numbers in it, you know, so it's not quantified. It's more about the spirit, the energy, the principle, the emotion. Four. Yeah, like that it's, that, you know, we, we will do this X number of times, or in Esther's example, you know, $500. There's something about putting numbers to it that then there's, it's so, it's so measurable in quantity. I wonder if that would be an interesting challenge to see if you Look, could. But what feels controlling to one feels securing to the other. Hmm. That's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. To me, to one, to, to somebody else, to, you know, the amount of what you can spend until you have to discuss it is is a control. But to the other person who may have come from another story where somebody was spending money, God knows, you know, the idea that you would come and check, you know, spells collaboration, connection, mm. uh, consultation, respect for my opinion, you know, inclusion. So it's a very interesting thing. The, <laughs> I do, like you, would rather go for, you know, something that is more collaborative than surveillance. But I understand that what some people experience as surveillance, their partner may experience as safe. Yes, because then if we've agreed $500, then I have got all the freedom in the damn world to go out and spend $499. Like that is freedom. <laughs> Fascinating. That's right. It's not the number. It's not the number. It's the energy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the next question is, how do I tell whether a recurring relational trigger is due to my own historical trauma that needs to be addressed versus inappropriate or disrespectful behavior on my partner's part. It's both. <laughs> <laughs> Next. It's, both. it's the, mm -hmm. this, it's a, it's a, it's an inappropriate or what you deem inappropriate comment of your partner that triggers something, which obviously if it triggers it, it means that it means something to you. Otherwise you wouldn't hear it. There are plenty of other things that you don't hear that somebody else would be sweating over. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, the, the trigger is defined by the combination of both your personal history and what your partner is doing. And your partner is doing just enough to get that thing going. <laughs> if somebody <laughs> else who does a little bit less, you may not even get triggered. Mm -hmm. It's just the right amount for the, for the right condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I, I understand, I understand, I feel like I understand the spirit behind the question. It's like, is it my job to fix it or is it my part, right? Is it, do I soothe myself or does my partner soothe me? And I understand that. And it's a both, right? And I, I also want, I also want the member of the community to be in a relationship where their partner understands the landscape of their triggers, not so that the partner walks on eggshells, but so the partner can say, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Right. Not I'm a piece of shit because I triggered you, but it makes sense given what I know, I can, I hold that image of, you know, little boy, you and what, and the pain that you went through when you were little. And it makes sense to me that that's an area 
that, you know, I, I can hold myself in warm regard while understanding that when I said this to you, it, it triggered that old feeling in you. Yeah, all that. So I have a beautiful example of a couple I, I was working with this week, and, you know, he would say, we just don't get along. <laughs> and he just puts it out there. And then instantly she starts to talk about, but I am really changed, and I am, you know, and she, and you could see that she heard it as from the ear that has felt for many, 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 many decades, I'm not enough. The ear, I'm not enough, yeah. heard the statement, we don't get along as it's because of you. That's right. And mm -hmm. that is, a, you know, but that ear of I'm not enough would be dormant. It would be latent if he didn't systematically throw out these sentences, we just don't get along, <laughs> you know, and, and let's it sit that He doesn't say, mm. I wish I, we would get along better. He doesn't say, I haven't been very present. He, 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 there, he doesn't really say it's you, but there is mm -hmm. just enough space for her to then insert herself into his statement. Yep. And so it's a both and. Mm -hmm. And it does invite her to really not just say to him, I'm, I'm, I'm enough, but to say to the little one that sits on top of her shoulder, you know, it's, you know, you're not that nine-year-old anymore. You know, do you, you are enough. You're an amazing woman. Mm -hmm. And at the same time to say to him, when you say that statement, it stings. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. I know you probably don't mean me necessarily. I think you're making a statement about us in general, but... For, for whatever reason that I'm owning, mm -hmm. it stings. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could change the lines. And I, you know, it's a both end. You will change the lines. I will, you know, tell this one, don't make it all about you. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's a great, that's a very, very common example. I think that everybody listening to this podcast will relate to. That's right. We, there's, there's something that we want to ask of both people, right? There's a little bit in that where he's putting, he's putting his exasperation at her feet and he knows he can put it at her feet because she will pick it up and take responsibility for it. And there, there's and a, sits there helpless. And sure. It's all agitated. Sure, 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 sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. he doesn't know what to do and she gets into overdrive. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. Robin is absorbing all of this. <laughs> sure am. <laughs> As we're passing. <laughs> so, I oh, hope you so community members that question. we are really addressing your questions. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I, it's it's gold. Liquid gold. We're getting we're getting therapy on this on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question is about heartache, which I think is very prevalent in any of uh, in all of our lives. I mean, we we do go in and out of heart, heartbreak in in many ways. Um, but this the question is: How do you get over someone that you're still in love with that does not want to be with you anymore? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's we that's yeah. A hard one. It's a hard we've one. Experienced it. We've all experienced it. I mean, it's a hard one, and it and it hurts because it hurts, right? There's research that shows the part of our brain that is activated in heartbreak is the same part of our brain that's activated when we break a leg. Like that hurt hurts because it hurts. Like that's or we just roll from heroin. Or that's right. That's right. People who are who and are going through. Research. I mean, it is really yep. the first thing is to really understand that it is a, a serious ache and pain. That's right. That it's oh, not just definitely. You know, yeah. Like your heart is broken and there's no doubt about it. Like, yeah. And that, yes. and that, and this is, I mean, I spend so much time with my college students, you know, validating this. It doesn't, it, your heartbreak has zero shits to give if it was a six month relationship or a six year relationship, or if yeah, it was, if true. they were no good for you anyways, if your brother didn't like them, like it doesn't matter all we, we try so hard in the space of heartbreak to create narrative around it, to contain it. And the narrative around it is like nothing compared to the magnitude and the texture and the tone of heartbreak. And so our, the, really our only move is to just carry it and, and be with it and to know just to know that it isn't, it is not going to be, it's not going to for, be forever at this, at this intensity forever, right? And therapists love to say the way out is through. So you have to arrive before you can leave. And then also the, in, in the experience of heartbreak, you know, heart, grief is synergistic. So a grief in, in this moment 
it has energetic ties to every prior grief we've experienced. So it's, it's, I'm grieving the loss of this partner, but I'm also now grieving the loss of my mother, the loss of my homeland, the loss of that dream I had. So there's so many layers. And so it's another way I think that we invalidate is by acting as if the loss of, you know, what is it that's so special about this partner? They were just a mere mortal. There's a yes and. Yes and in losing this partner, you are awakened to so much, to every prior loss, frankly, every prior loss you've ever experienced. I think that that's, that's a, a, a very important piece that people don't always think about. Mm -hmm. A person is a portal to a world. Mm -hmm. And with, with them going goes a whole world. Go the people that you met through him, go the place where you've lived with that, him, heard them. Um, you know, it's not just the person. No, and um, the family, unless, that's you, the first unless thing. you're married, then, it's like the whole family. Sure. You're yeah. with. Yeah. It's like you are literally grieving the loss of a whole family. Right. That and I would say, thing. don't stay in touch with them. Don't stay in touch no. with that person. Yeah, in the because beginning. they're loyal and they're, well, you know, that, that whole loyalty play, I experienced it. It's like, I know what it's like. It's just like, well, I'm loyal to him, so I'm not going to talk to you anymore. It's like, well, what is love? Like, I believe mm -hmm. in love. Like, love doesn't end. That's my motto. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but that's not their motto like so it's a different it, there's like rules that don't you know so it's such a it's like so much there's so many dynamics at play uh -huh. when you break up with someone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. guy winch wrote a beautiful little book how to mend a broken heart um that i have often recommended as well as his ted talk yeah um, because it's very explicit and it gives you a few real concrete things of what to do. Um, one of them that is interesting is, you know, you still love that person, but the question is, do you st now that this has all happened, do you want to live with that person still? Do you still want to be in a relationship with that person? And then it, sometimes it's do a kind of a, a little bit of a work on your head where you make a list of all the things that draw you in and all the things about the person that you didn't care for so much. Right. And you try to look at that list so that you don't just begin to idealize them by the sheer loss and absence of them. They become even more phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, so you keep it grounded a little bit more in reality. It, was all, it wasn't all rosy mm -hmm. all the time either. Um, I think that sometimes is useful. There's a, lots of different things that people can do. <clears throat> and I'll give you one more that I find very helpful. But really, this is, tr you try a bunch and then you see what, <laughs> what hooks. And sometimes you try the same one three times and the fourth time it works. Yeah. So don't worry about it. You, it's not like there is the, the thing we, you immediately find out, how do I get over this person that I still love? But what I do think is very important is that you find yourself in other situations with friends and other people that are close to you who value you. Because the loss uh. of a person is such a loss of sense of value. Of, I don't matter enough, and therefore I can be just rejected, ejected. And you want people who really tell you how much you matter in their lives, how, how happy they hmm. are that they have you, and that they value you. Um, they don't need to devalue your partner. Because then mm -hmm. that actually makes you protect them more. Yeah. But they have to be very explicit about how much they value you. And they have to tell you things that in that moment you don't believe and mm -hmm. you don't feel. Beautiful. But they have to hold this for you. Beautiful. They keep telling you, yeah. you know, you, you are an incredible person and you will find someone else if you choose to. And you will overcome this, you know. You don't mm. feel it now, but we know it. And we are here for you now and we will be here when you reach to the other side of the mm -hmm. tunnel. I love, I love in our responses, there's this like toggling between like the big existential nature of the loss of a person and the need for micro action steps and practices. You know, both those things have to be held, the big picture and the little picture. Absolutely. Because you can, all, all this is so important. I, I think about that. I mean, your breakup is... It's a grief. You have to live through it. You have to work through it. And I, I think a lot of people don't actually think of it as grieving. 
But actually, Can I give you an example? Somebody that you spent a lot of time with. Right. Yeah. Even yeah. if you didn't spend, like, let's just say your heart is broken. It's broken. Okay. Let's acknowledge. Let's accept. And then go through the grieving process. Like, it is a process. Right. But you have, what you want a little bit is to spell out. That I remember a woman who blew my mind because she came up with all of it on her own, I have to say. I mean, I, we created it together. But she came in 20-something years into it discovers, you know, whatever other things he's been up to, decides to leave, <coughs> and does two things that I thought were so beautiful. I, the first one I, I, I liked ever since, you know, and even before. She made a list of five people that she really thought would understand what she's going through. Mm -hmm. And she took two weeks, and she traveled around the country and went to visit all five of these people. Oh, wow. I love that. So good. So good. So good. <sighs> food for the heart, food for the soul. Yes. You don't sit there alone and weep. Mm -mm. This is no, not something you're like, you okay, I'm going to go on this journey and like talk to people that would like know me so and good. would have compassion for the situation. Yeah. And then she began to paint. She always wanted oh. to paint, you know, and, uh, and so she started to take painting lessons. What I'm saying is that yeah. she was doing erotic things. Th That's this right. is eroticism. That's right. You know, friendship. Yeah. Art, Art, painting, self-expression. Mm -hmm. And she did this, uh, she embarked in these erotic expressions, meaning antidotes to deadness. Yeah. Deadness being the death of the relationship. Yeah. She didn't yeah. mourn antidotes by just deadness. staying in the morning. Yeah. She went through the morning by affirming life. And yeah. this is very, very important. <sighs> You know, yeah. often we think only when I've processed, I'm going to be able to go back to dancing and singing and painting. And, mm -hmm. you know, no, it's you those dance very through it. You have to dance through it. You, have to, you do. It's what, uh, it's, you know, Aristotle <laughs> said, nature abhors a vacuum. So she, f she filled the vacuum with friendship and art. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. And it's, it's so good. and the, um, the cognitive behavioral therapists, right? They talk about behavioral activation. You do the thing to get the feeling. So she yeah. did the thing. She went to the friends. She went beautiful. Those, that's a wonderful example. Mm -hmm. oh, that's mm -hmm. beautiful. The Jewish tradition says the same thing. You don't have to feel in order to do. It's the doing that will create the experience and bring up the feeling. It's very it's, pragmatic. There are many mm -hmm. traditions that have, you know, set it up from that place. Just the action ex itself, action is an experience. In the action will become the feeling rather than waiting till I feel Wait. like it and then I go do it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a lot of discussion in our community about opening relationships. And I think COVID brought on a lot of that too. Like we're stuck in the same home with the same person 24 seven. And anyways, I've heard it so much, right? So the question is, I've got two questions from our community. I've been hearing a lot about polyamory and open marriages. I want to approach my partner about this to see if their interest, what, what, what is their interest in this? We have been married for 15 years, but our sex life is non-existent. Issues mostly on my side. Trauma from childhood. We love each other, and neither of us want to end our marriage, but we're wanting to see if there's something that should be considered. I haven't broached the subject with my partner, but I wanted to understand how I go about doing that. And the second question on the same note is if, if one was to suggest an open relationship, how do I go about doing that without seeming like the other partner is lacking? Because mm -hmm. I think that is another thing too, right? You're like, it's, it's very sensitive. Well, I, I'll just say something briefly and then Esther, I'm happy to punch you. I, you know, I... My, one of my first thoughts, and I think there's a risk, I think that we, because we have normalized sexual monogamy, what that means is that those who explore anything in the realm of consensual or ethical non-monogamy, polyamory, open relationships are at risk of feeling pathologized and certainly have been pathologized by our field. I think our field has, has done a lot of damage around alternative arrangements. I, so, I, so there's a risk in me bringing this up. And at the same time, one of the things that strikes me about this question is what she's saying is part of the struggle in her marriage is that, is that her own traumas 
are, pro- are creating problems in their erotic connection. So I would, if I was her therapist, I would really want to thoughtfully, not because I'm pathologizing consensual non-monogamy, but I would want to be really curious about what is, how is this an attempted solution to something that has to do with deeper childhood trauma? Um, and I would worry, I just would want to be mindful and thoughtful and intentional about that because I don't, I would want just to have a kind of a, a really thoughtful, supportive narrative around are we, are we bypassing something? Are we, is she putting, is she at risk of putting herself in a spot where she is um, kind of being, I don't, I don't know. So that, that, that part of it just kind of sits with me, sits, sits with me, me in a troubling way. But certainly, yeah, sexual monogamy is one, is, is a choice that has a set of consequences. And any kind of open relationship is another choice that has all kinds of consequences as well. So it is not, I think, in our effort to destigmatize and depathologize, which we absolutely need to do, I worry about us somehow being at risk of painting a utopian vision of it as well. It is not a solution in and of itself. It's one that needs to be, I want couples to be very well resourced. And luckily, she's, you know, she's loving in a time when there are wonderful resources out there. So I think that's the most important thing is kind of plan, planful, mindful, thoughtful, intentional mm-hmm. choices. I had the same reaction to the first question. I think the, the, the questions are very different. The first one says, we have a problem. Yeah. And I would like to think about opening the relationship as a, as a way of dealing with this problem. The second person says, we have a model. The model is that one person should be enough for everything. And that if you want more, it devalues the person. And it says, you're not enough because if you were everything, then I wouldn't need to think about others. So one question is about the cultural model, the model of exclusiveness, the way that romanticism has set it up. And the other one is um, a modern solution to an old problem, which is what happens here? Why did you shut down mm-hmm. community member? What, ha- you know, that's, the, okay, you say you have something, it's due to you because of the past, but that doesn't tell me much. I would, if I was in conversation with you, what, how did you shut down? Were you always shut down to this person? Is there something that makes you be shut down when you're in the context of family? Why do you think that you will be less shut down and less and more free or more alive or more expressive or more erotic and sensual if you are in an open situation? Are you doing it for you or are you doing it to liberate your partner because you're afraid that otherwise one day they'll either cheat or bolt? Mm. You know, who is this for? Yeah. You know, is this uh, many gay couples who have not been necessarily sexual with each other have created openness as a way to say we have emotional monogamy and we have sexual um, um, openness and sexual non monogamy, if you want, or plurality. So it's not like the model is unknown, it's just that it's less common and, le- and, and there needs to be more learned for straight couples to think like that. But the conversation, since both people ask, how do I begin the conversation? You don't start to talk about opening up if you don't have a relationship where you have open conversations, period. The word open oh, first has gosh, to apply that, to the that quality right there is of, like, like, that's a, whoa. You know, whoa. first you need to open up the quality yes. of the conversations. <laughs> are you people who are openly talking ab- with each other about all kinds of things? You know, what hmm. your, your aspirations, your dreams, your disappointments, your frustrations, your longings, the things that you don't have with each other, which, you know, everybody has without thinking that that is, you know, taboo. Open up the conversation first. The openness in a relationship, you know, you can have an open relationship that is, as in non-monogamous, that is utterly not open. Mm-hmm. Because some, one person just said to the other, this is what I need and this is what I want. So I want to really play with the value and the quality and the preciousness of the word open, okay? Open means, you know, open-minded, tolerant, welcoming, curious, interested, you know, even if the other person will say that's not for me, they may want to still have an open conversation that says, why do you think that would be good for us, for you? What do you look in there? What would it mean? What do we do if this happens and that happens? There's a whole literature out there that I also invite you to read from Polysecure to Polyamory a Guide, uh, you know, there are a number of very good books to, to uh, Tammy Nelson's books. I mean, people are really trying to give couples yeah. a vocabulary for how to have these conversations, you know. But what do you do when you say, I haven't been there for you sexually. I know that. I have been shut down. 
Shall we talk about that? You know, um, I know that that must be painful to you, or I know you've tried many things, or I wish you would try certain things, or I don't know why I'm not able to experience this with you, and that must be really painful because hmm. sexual rejection is acutely painful. You know, it's a, a unique kind of rejection. And that's where you begin in the conversation is where have we been at? How have we be, both experienced this? What does this mean for us? Have you ever thought about what we could do? Do you sometimes think that opening up could be an option? Do you sometimes think that leaving each other could be an option? These are very difficult yeah. but very courageous conversations that yeah. people need to have. And unfortunately, most couples, straight couples in particular, wait till there is a crisis mm -hmm. to have those conversations for the first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, 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 okay, no. That's, mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. it. I, like, I just, I so love that. Yeah. What you said about if you're going to have an open conversation about opening your marriage and your relationship, you first, to first start it, is your relationship already open with different uh -huh. conversations? Yeah. yeah. That's literally, that's, that's the truth of it, right? That's like, great. Oh, Goodness, mm -hmm. you can't drop the bomb with, if you haven't already like, if you haven't already had those conversations or those that intimacy with your partner already. Well, it, it it gets to that second question, doesn't it? About like how do I not how do I not convey that I'm asking for this because my partner is lacking? It's not. It's only a framework of lacking if it's a right hand turn. You know, from we haven't taught, we haven't been vulnerable, we haven't been open, and now I'm kind of dropping this bomb, as you say, Robin. Versus, I mean, open also implies: do you talk about your exes? Do you know? Do you let the other person see that you've noticed someone that you're attracted to mm -hmm. when you're on the street or in a club or at a party? Mm -hmm. Do you talk about your fantasies? All of that is part of open. You know, open doesn't start the day you begin to talk about wanting to be with other people. Uh huh. And so I would, I would imagine, Esther, that there's a set of couples for whom just opening up those kinds of conversations, that's enough of a flex. It's not whether or not either of us ever goes to bed with somebody else. It's that's just, right. oh, what now we have just infused our connection. We've like opened the boundary up enough that there's some air now and there's some space and I see you as separate from me. And that's interesting. That, that quality of open... definition of monogamy? I think if we truly yeah. began to talk about our definition of monogamy, we'd probably have very, you know, have, most couples have never asked. That's right. What's your definition of monogamy? The same way that you say, what's your definition of marriage? Mm -hmm. What do you want? What do you think it is? What do you want to find there? What do you want to bring there? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's that. It's, uh, the, the talking about the exes is particularly important. Yes. It's very telling to what people can tolerate accepting in their midst. Do you pretend that this is the beginning of the whole story? There's never been anything else before, mm -hmm. especially not after. Or do you actually, you know, understand that in some interesting way today in the West, we all have been polyamorous. Yeah. We've had boyfriends, girlfriends, partners, you know, yeah. um, because we have the permission to be intimate and sexual, you know, long before we settle with one person. So, you know, in a way, if you really want to talk about polyamory or non-monogamy, <laughs> monogamy used to be one person for life, and today monogamy is one person at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so people tell you, I'm monogamous in all my relationships, plural. Right. <laughs> you know? What does that mean? This mm -hmm. is a complete... My mother wouldn't know what I'm talking about no. with that definition of monogamy, let alone my grandmother. Okay. So this is the conversation. You start... Like that, you don't start talking about who can go where with whom. There's I love a beautiful it. That's episode right. mm -hmm. on the podcast that is called You Want Me to Watch the Kids While You Go Out with Other Men. And she basically says to him, I, on, on, it's on where should we begin? And she says, you know, I, my sexuality belonged to my Indian culture, to my Christian family, to my Christian boarding school, to, to patriarchy, you name it. You know, it's never been mine. And the only place I can feel that it's mine is away from us, mm -hmm. away from the, the institution called marriage. And he says, but, you know, I know that you love to ride this horse, but I want to be your only stallion. It's a beautiful <laughs> thing. And he says it to her. Mm -hmm. says, I'm not ready to, you know, I, I, I know that what we have is special, but I want to be the only one mm -hmm. and the best one and the first one mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then I met them again two years later. 
I just dropped it in the, the oh. new story about what happened two years later to this couple who did open up their relationship and they give it to you in real granular form. It's one story, Wonderful. one example only. But but if you want to hear these two people begin the conversation, this is a very good... Um, it, it, mm. And it's nice to listen together as a couple because yes. it invites you, as Alex was saying before, the, the triangle to reflect on that couple but to talk about yourselves beautiful mm -hmm. I'm just looking at the time and I'm like oh my goodness yes I yeah. think so time. we did it we're over it and mm -hmm. we've done it well we, we have answered not, not, not all the questions but we've answered a lot of questions and it's been amazing and I want to thank you both Dr. Solomon and Esther Perel for your time and something you said earlier in our discussion, Esther, was about your practitioners. This is the real deal. Like you're, you're seeing patients, you're seeing clients, couples, individuals with these issues all day, day in, day out in your practices, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, this is so when you. a person asks a question, we hear a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Behind, you know, it's not just some generality, and That's you can't right. answer it in one way, flat answer. You no. know, same size for everybody. No. No, but that, that's right. That's right. And so that is the hope is that this community will take, take all the little bits that feel, that feel right for them and then leave, leave all the rest of it. That's right. Because no, no one answer is going, to be, is going to fit your situation perfectly, but then you get to stretch it or bend it or patch it together in a way that, that fits for you. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you well, so much. Mm -hmm. So appreciate your time and everything you've given to our community today. And love you both. Thank you so, <laughs> so, so, so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Evan. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> Please visit realloveready.com to become a member of our community. Submit your relationship questions for our podcast experts at reallovereadypodcast at gmail.com. We read everything you send. Be sure to rate and review this podcast. Your feedback helps us get you the relationship advice and guidance you need. The Real Love Ready podcast is recorded and edited by Maya Anstey. Transcriptions by otter.ai and edited by Maya Anstey. We at Real Love Ready acknowledge and express gratitude for the Coast Salish people, the stewards of the land on which we work and play and encourage everyone listening to take a moment to acknowledge and express gratitude for those that have stewarded and continue to steward the land that you live on as well.